Good morning. Welcome to Oak Street this morning. Whether you're joining us here in person or online or on the radio, we're glad that you're here this morning. Let's stand together and worship as we call those that are still coming in to come into the house of the Lord. invite you to clap this morning if you want to. Good morning. You may be seated. It's good to see you here today. My name is Stephen. I'm the student pastor here. We'd like to welcome you uh, to our Sunday service here at Oak Street Baptist Church. 
We'll give a special shout out to those listening on 100.5 FM and who are joining us on Facebook Live. Thank you for being here with us this morning. If you take out your bulletins, I've got a few things I want to draw your attention to. First off, we have uh, some tear-off sections in the bulletin. Uh, the first thing that you'll see if you open it up on the one side uh, is a place for you to put prayer requests. So every Tuesday morning, uh, we spend some time in prayer as a staff, praying for whatever is going on in the lives of, of our church family. And so if there's something that you want us to join you in prayer about, please put it on here and you can drop it off in the offering box on your way out this morning. On the other side of that tear-out section is a response uh, to the message today. So PJ is going to draw attention to that at the end of the sermon, so just know that that's there. We also have in your bulletin a little handout about what's going on at Open Door Christian School. And so this has information about what they're doing there, the enrollment, some clubs, some fundraising, just a lot of cool stuff that's going on with our school. I think they're going to give us one of these every month just so that we can be involved and engaged in what's going on with our Christian school. And finally, the last handout is for those of you who are new here. In the seat back in front of you, there is a visitor's packet that has information about who we are as a church, what we believe, and how you can get involved. The main thing you'll need to know if you're new here there is another tear-out section there. We love those here at Oak Street. There's another tear-out in the visitor packet that you can fill out and drop that off in your offering box on your way out. That'll be your gift to us today. So, looking forward, um, oh, there's one, there's one last handout. We have so many handouts today, Chris. This is crazy. On your way out to Lifetime, we have a presidential voter guide that's available in the foyer if you would like to pick that up. It's very important uh, for us to vote, to be involved in, in our government. And so we have a voter guide for you that's going to be out in the foyer that you can pick up on your way to Lifetime after the service today. Coming up uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. this evening is our monthly Lifetime Fellowship. Um, that's going to be happening wherever your Lifetime leaders have told you that it's going to be happening. So if you don't know, um, talk to your Lifetime leaders. If you're not involved in a Lifetime class, um, we have a greeter's desk out there. You can ask them, pick a class today, and I'm sure they would love for you to join them tonight at their fellowship. That's going to be from 5 to 7 p.m. tonight. Wednesday night. Um, we're so excited about all that's going on here at the church on Wednesday. Everything starts at 6 p.m. I want to give a special shout out this week uh, to our kids ministry across the street is going to have glow night. So in laugh, it's glow night. I don't exactly know what all that means, but I know there is a ton of glow sticks and black lights, and it's going to be a big party in our kids' ministry. So come, bring your family, bring your kids. It's going to be a wonderful Wednesday night here at Oak Street. Everything starts at 6 p.m. Coming up, uh, the last announcement I have for you today, in two weeks, we are having our ultimate half-nighter up here at the church for our student ministry. A couple things there. Number one, send your students to this half-nighter. We're going to have a great time, lots of games, prizes, food, sharing the gospel. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time. And the second thing is if you have any boxes lying around at your house, we would love to use those. We have a special game that we're going to be doing that we need a ton of boxes for. So small boxes, big boxes, whatever they look like, please bring them up. I think we're going to store them in Pastor Joe's office. So you just come in and bring them. There. Oh, I'm sorry. It says the youth hall. My bad, Pastor Joe. But anyway, bring those up to the church. We would love, uh, we just, it's going to be a really fun, really fun night for the students. That's all that I have for you this morning. And so I'd like to invite uh, Lewis and Jenna Simmental up this morning, who are going to bring us our scripture and prayer. Good morning, church. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from Romans 1, 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just, it is, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul is one of my favorite authors of the Bible. Just, uh, he's very inspirational about convictions and obedience. He brings it in such a manner that just, it speaks to you. It lifts you up. It encourages you. And that's something we're all called to do. We're called to build each other's faith up. We're 
called to pray for one another. We're called to encourage one another. We're called to hold each other accountable, to love on one another, to be there in crisis. And uh, so if you would, just pray with me. Father God, we just come to you and we just, we thank you for this morning, Father God. We thank you for your word. Father God, we thank you for your son that paid the ultimate price, Father God. And we thank you for the hope that we have that this isn't the end game, Father God. We thank you for the peace that we have, Lord. We thank you for your love, Father God. We thank you for the faith that you've given us, Father God. We thank you for your salvation, Father God. I just pray that you would build us up, Father God, to be obedient, Lord, to share the faith that you've given us, to go out and make disciples of all nations, Father God, and to encourage one another, to build each other up, Father God. I just pray that you would bless Pastor Joe, as he comes and brings the message, Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, Father God, that you would call us out, Father God, to, to seek you faithfully, Father God, and to share who you are with others each and every day, Father God. And I thank you for all these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 Would you all stand with us again? And we're going to just continue to worship this morning and lift high and magnify the name of Jesus.
By the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sins they So tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Yeah. 
we sing this next song, I want to just open up the altar. So you know the altar at Oak Street is always open, but I want to extend a special invitation right now as we sing this next song.
think of the words of that song, and I think, God, why, why won't we be like you, God? Why will you tear down every barrier? Why will you chase after us with beautiful, perfect, unending love? And yet, Lord, the, the littlest thing just throws us off. The littlest thing keeps us from chasing after and going after and seeking after that which is lost. Father, I, I ask you to forgive me for being so easily distracted, discouraged, pull, pulled off course. Moved away, Father, from those who need you the most. Those whose lives are broken and shattered and needy. And in so many ways, crying out for your love and your salvation. Lord, I pray again, and I hope it's not just some little rote thing, Lord. I pray for myself. I pray for us at Oak Street that, God, we would let you break our heart for what breaks your heart. Change our heart, Lord. Make our heart like your heart. God, do whatever it takes to get our attention, to get our affection, to make your desire our desire. Lord, I, I'm i fully aware, as all of us are, Lord, there's a, there's a plague in the land. Father, there's a plague of sin in our land. And we're not going to change that, Lord. Only that beautiful finished work of the cross will do this, Lord. And so we cry out, Lord, do a work in us this morning so that you may do a work through us, Lord, as we step out into this dark world, this broken world. We trust you. We love you. We cry out, God, be glorified in your church and in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. And we've got a lot of uh, a lot of territory, I guess I should say, to uh, cover this morning. Open your Bible to Matthew 4.19. This is one of the very first verses I ever learned after I became a Christian, was in the Navigator's Topical Memory System and in that very first uh, set of verses. And uh, I'd heard the song growing up in church, the little Make You Fishers of Men song, but I guess it never really took it to heart till I saw it in the Bible. But what, what I'm, my point is, one verse can change your life, it can change your mind, it can change your perspective, it can change your outlook, it can, it can change your heart. And so I'm going to prove that to you this morning by starting off. I want to give you one half of one verse I read in my quiet time this week. And I'm telling you, it's life changing. So go ahead and put this verse up. It's Leviticus 3.16. And here's what it says. All the fat is the Lord's. And I read that and I said, praise God. The burden is his. Mine to carry no longer. Lord, here it is. It's all yours. And I'm, I'm totally free now. I can eat anything and everything I want because the fat is the Lord's. My point is, listen, if you don't have a little sense of humor in life, you need to get one, okay? Life is so hard. It can be so harsh. It can be so difficult. If you don't have a little fun in there in a little while and have a little, uh, you know, enjoyment, and uh, boy, it's, it's just a tough road to hoe. So, Leviticus 3.16, remember, the fat is the Lord's. Let me give you another half of a verse that will change your life. 1 Timothy 4.7, B, train yourself to be godly. Man, this is just half of one verse. Well, take this one to heart. Look at this and, and appreciate it, and it, it is life-changing. My good friend Shannon Docksetter is a personal fitness trainer, and I watch him... Uh, 
you know, encourage people and teach people and help people and motivate people to, to you know, get healthy and eat healthy and exercise and, and do these things. And, and I go, Lord, that's what I want to be. I want to be a personal spiritual trainer for people. I want to train people and, and show people the value, the benefit of being a godly person, living a godly life, myself included. Because Paul says this, physical training is of some value. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise in this life and the life to come. I mean, you talk about a win-win situation. And I love those, man, where everybody benefits, everybody's blessed, everybody moves up a notch, and, and this is one. Man, it is a win-win this life to be godly. You're being a blessing to others. But it's also for the life that is to come. And we say, oh, eternal life. Man, that's a, that's a long, long time. This life's just a snap of the fingers, eternal life. Well, let's get ready for it. Let's train ourselves to be godly so that we can live eternally with not regret, but with rejoicing. And so we're finishing this morning this series, Disciplines That Determine Your Destiny. And we've talked about three. This morning will be the fourth one. Let's review very quickly. The first D, the first discipline is the Word of God. Look at Psalms 119.72. It says, The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. How many of you this morning honestly would say the Word of God has improved my life? The Word of God. That's most of us here. The Word of God has improved my life. And the Word of God is more precious than thousands of pieces of gold and silver. Folks, this is a treasure chest. This book is filled with riches for this life. Not, not money. That, that comes and goes, but the things that really matter, love and kindness and relationships and, and depth of character. Man, this is, this is not just a tool chest to use when you go to work as, the, as a, you know, trying to do the Christian job. This is a treasure chest, and to open it to our hearts and minds and lives every day, all we're going to do is get better and more like Christ. The second D is discipline is life of prayer. Jesus said, if you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Listen, if prayer is not such a big and great and wonderful thing, why does the devil fight it so much? I mean, why would you think, man, I need to stop and pray? All of a sudden, your mind has a thousand other things to do, right? And you start to pray, and all of a sudden, we're thinking about this, and, and every distraction, every discouragement you can find under the sun comes when it's time to pray. There's a reason for that. The devil cannot stop God answering your prayers. If he can stop us from praying, he's, he's going to win a lot of the battles. But once you and I start praying, God is released to do a great, great work in our life. The third D, we talked about this last week, is the community of believers. Look what Ephesians 2, 21 and 22 says. In Him, the whole building is joined together, and it becomes, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Yes, God lives in you if you're a follower, a believer in Jesus Christ. God lives in you. That's, that's good and that's, that's right. But listen, the, the corporate you, when Paul said Christ in you, the hope of glory, that word was not in the singular, it was in the plural. He was talking to a church where two or three gather in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, we can say, well, Lord, you're already in me. Why? Because there's just this multiplying synergistic effect. And when you and I come together, when we gather together, iron sharpens iron. We're blessing each other. We're encouraging uh, each other. We're helping each other. What kind of the things Lewis was saying this morning. And so these are three disciplines that are, that are absolutely essential. And let me just say it one more time. A discipline doesn't save you. A discipline doesn't make you. What a discipline does, it puts us in a place. It puts us under the spout of God's grace and God's blessings and God's spirit. It's a choice you and I make to say, I'd, I'd rather live under the, the blessings and the spirit and the spout of God 
than trying to slug it out on my own. And this morning, our fourth one, our fourth discipline, the last one we'll talk about, and you say, well, why don't we do ten? Because listen, if you don't do these four, you, there's not a chance it, in anything that we're going to do. Much. You give someone a hundred, if, if these four do not change your life, if you're not willing to embrace these four basic disciplines, the Word of God, prayer, community of believers, and, and evangelism, sharing our faith, then we wouldn't do it if the list was a hundred miles long. And so here's Matthew 4.19, not part of it, but all of it. And he said unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. One statement with incredible implications. Now, you know, full disclosure, that seems to be a very important thing in this day and age. So let me fully disclose this. I've been fishing twice in my life, okay? I didn't like it the first time because I didn't catch any fish. I didn't like it the second time because I did catch fish. And I was expected to clean them, and I had no desire to do that. So from my inexperience, I want to share with you seven conclusions that I've drawn. What little I know about fishing. Number one, there are different ways to catch fish. I've, I've, you know, I'm, again, just trying to figure it out. You, you can use a, a cane pole with a string. You can use a rod and reel. You can use a net. You can fish from a boat. You can fish from a dock. There just seems to be lots of different ways to fish. And the point of that is, folks, there are a lot of ways to reach people. There are a lot of ways to share our faith. And there's something inside of us that seems like if it's not my way, it's not the right way. Now, that's just kind of a general rule, but it seems to be that way. And somebody says, no, the way to win people to Christ is one-on-one -on -one evangelism. The way to win Christ is crusade evangelism. Get a, get a lot of people together. There are many, many ways to share our faith, just as there are ways to fish. The second thing is most fishermen have their spot. The most guarded secret of the universe, right, is where you catch the big fish. And so, it, that's again, that's the way it, it seems. It seems like you know where they're biting. You know where to go. You know, you know how, to, how to get the job done. Listen, I really believe each of us have a place where we are more effective. And that does not mean I only share my faith one place with one setting with one group of people. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if to really understand ourselves and who we are and our wiring and our makeup and our personality and our experiences and these kind of things will, will show us probably there are some people that are just super effective in sharing the gospel with children. I mean, you know, they just got that heart for kids and, and they can overlook a lot of things and a lot of the noise and all the distractions and share the gospel well with them. There are other people, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's teenagers, maybe it's senior adults, maybe it's at, at some particular workplace or venue or something like that. I'm just saying, when you and I start looking for our white fields of harvest, when we start looking, God where do you want to use me most effectively? That will usually be a, a key to effective evangelism. Number three, fish don't like to be caught. Now, it seems to me like this is, this is the rub. This is where it gets tough because fish don't usually jump in the boat. And they usually don't jump in the frying pan. Okay, they just, they, they've got this resistance, this self-survival mode, so they, they don't want to be caught with the exception of Charlie Tuna. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the tuna that wanted to get caught. He wanted to be in that can of tuna, but he didn't make the cut. And what did the guy say to him? Sorry, Charlie, you're just not, you're not uh, quality material. But most people, sinners love their sin. They don't like to be reminded of their sin. And, 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 uh, Unbelievers don't like to be reminded of their unbelief. And so there is this resistance that we have to understand. They will make any and every excuse not to come into the light, not to get caught. Number four, the most important, uh, it's, excuse me, number four, it's important to have the right bait. 
Now, I know some of you guys, this is your science, okay? You, I mean, uh, guys, maybe girls, uh, this is really your strong suit. Man, you have it figured out. You know exactly what bait to use with the different kind of fishing that you do. Uh, the bait is what lures people in. It's what, it's what brings the fish in to the hook or to the net. Listen, for most people, becoming a Christian began with a desire. It began with an interest. There's something they saw in somebody else's life. There's something they witnessed or experienced that said, you know, I, I think I'm ready to try that. I want to investigate that. I want to take a step toward that instead of a step away from it. And that's what we're, we're kind of using this, this term, the bait. We must be very careful when we start judging and criticizing and critiquing people who are using different bait than we are. Listen, it might be a pizza party. It might be a drawing for a, for a gun or a, a four-wheeler. It could be all these different things that God uses in people's lives to start the process of, of drawing them in. My son in Austin has a really good friend uh, who started something called RBI. It doesn't stand for ran, runners batted in. It stands, I don't remember what it stands for. But it, RBI stands for something that they are doing to reach inner cities, inner, inner city kids with the gospel. And so far, they've had a 1,000 inner city kids sign up to be on 70 baseball teams where they hear the gospel. And you heard of Upward, the, the, the basketball program for kids. It's the same thing. You like basketball? Hey, come. We've got a team, and we're going to share the gospel. And we're going to show you the love of God, and we're going to reach out to you in a different way. There are so many different ways to reach people. Number five, you can scare fish off. Now, I've heard this rule is you don't throw rocks into the water where somebody's fishing. Is that, I mean, am I right or wrong? I just, that's just kind of the impression I got. If somebody's fishing, you don't start chunking rocks beside uh, where, where they're fishing. And here, here's, here's the point. Hitting non-Christians over the head with the Bible or being very... Uh, judgmental or critical or hateful or hurtful of them that's just that doesn't work really well yeah you can get people to stay away from you you can get people to to quiet down a little bit but if your heart's desire is to reach people with the gospel this very critical and very hateful and very judgmental attitude has to go it just doesn't work listen most Churches and most Christians are known for what we're against instead of what we're for. Man, we can give a list a mile long of things we don't like, things we're against, things that offend us, things that set us on edge, as opposed to being for reaching people with the gospel of Christ. Number six, the more skilled the fisherman, the more fish caught. Abraham Lincoln used to say this, I will study, I will prepare, and my opportunity will come. They say luck meets at the corner of preparedness and diligence. And luck is a term losers use for winners. Ah, oh, they're just lucky. Oh, boy, they catch all the breaks. Boy, everything goes their way. Listen, if you see people reaching people for Christ, it's not because they're a lucky Christian. It's because they've developed skill and ability and they've thought through and they've worked through what is the most effective way for reaching people for Christ. What can I do? What kind of strategy can I employ? What does it take to be a soul winner? And then number seven, you don't have to beg real fishermen to fish. Okay? If somebody loves fishing, you just got to ask them once. If they like fishing, you can ask them twice. If they hate fishing, you can ask them the rest of their life. And it's not going to change anything. They just don't like it. They're just not going to do it. And so it seems with this idea of sharing our faith. 
Man, you can beg and plead and cajole, cajole and, and guilt people and harass them and harangue them all you want. If someone wants to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they'll find a way. If they don't, they won't. Which leads me to uh, the first scripture that we're going to look at. In fact, this is the Matthew 4.19 is, is in this, but I want to give you the whole context of this of this thought. It says in Matthew 4, 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a, a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. We'll look at that in a better translation. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Is it interesting to anybody except me that the first four disciples Jesus called were fishermen? Just coincidence? Just luck of the draw? Just the way it just happened to go? Or was there a reason for this? That these four, first four men that Jesus called to follow him all had the same profession. They all had, they had probably pretty close to the same skill set. They had the same mindset. They were in so many ways alike and they were fishermen. And Jesus called those four to follow him before he called anybody else. Let's think about it. And you see, here's, here's my point. We are called evangelical Christians. Okay, we're part of that branch, part of that, that group that are called evangelicals. The word evangelize in the dictionary means this. Evangelize, definition. To spread the Christian, Christian gospel by uh, means of preaching or personal witness. That's what we say we are. I'm an evangelical. What does that mean? It means I share the gospel either by personal witness or by public proclamation of the word. And yet, it seems to me that it takes a lot of pushing, a lot of motivating, a lot of repeating the same message to get us to, to do what we say we are. Isn't that does something sound just a little bit off there? I mean, I'm a salesman who never sells. I'm a cook who never cooks. I'm a this who never that. So just, something just doesn't add up there. And so as we, as, you know, as we go through this, we see all kinds of different motivations. We've got to be motivated. We've got to be pushed. We've got to be encouraged to do what we say we are. And over the years, I've seen lots of different motivations. And so I want to walk through these different motivations very quickly, and then we'll, we'll get to one last one. Okay? So here are motivations to evangelize. Number one, fear. God's angry with you. Man, if you're not sharing the gospel, God's not a happy camper. God is, God is very upset. And you know what happens when God gets upset at people? I mean, you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? You bet, if you're not afraid, you better be afraid. Because that other shoe is getting ready to drop. Why? Because you're not doing what God said to do. And that makes God angry. That makes God upset. Do you want God upset at you? Really? You want God angry at you? You better change the way you do things. Number two, guilt. People are going to hell. Don't you, don't you see that? People are going to hell, right? Men on the team are going to hell, and you're not trying to stop them. People at work, people at school, people in your neighborhood, they're marching right past you on their way to hell, and you're, you're not engaging them. You're not trying to reach them. You're not doing anything. Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 33, the, their blood is dripping off your hands. Proverbs chapter 24, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Warn those who are moving towards destruction. Another motivation, rewards. 
a soul winner's crown awaits you. There is one thing better than going to heaven, taking somebody with you. And don't you know every soul you win to Christ is going to be a, a jewel in your crown? Don't you know every, one, every person you reach, that's one more brick in your mansion? And so if you want a big crown with big jewels, and if you want a big mansion, and, and, and just think about the joy that you're going to have in heaven when you see someone that you've led to Christ. Man, this is, this is good stuff. Number four, our peers. Others are out witnessing. This is positive peer pressure that, that is used. Look at, look at those people who care. Look at those people who share. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're reaching people. Look at how they're trying to win people to faith in Christ. Don't you want to be a part of that club? Don't you want to be in the Fishers of Men club? Don't you want to join that happy throng that is sharing their faith with others? They're doing it. Why don't you do it? Number five, shame. This is my least favorite of all the motivators. What's, what's the matter with you? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, really. You to, you're so selfish. You're so lazy. My goodness. People lost, people dying, people going to hell, and you are just letting them. Why, what kind of a Christian are you? What, what's the matter with you? What's, what's wrong with you? Something, something needs to be fixed. Number six, love. These are your family and friends. The, these are the, you love these people. You love God and you love people. For the love of Christ. Reach out and share with these. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For Christ's love compels us. For we are convinced that one died for all. And therefore, if we just love God and love people more, we'd, more, we'd be more willing to share our faith. By the way, I agree 100% with that. <laughs> Number seven, pride. You're a real Christian witness. God's proud of you. Every time you share your faith, God is proud of you. And not only that, I'm proud of you. We're all proud of you, man. You're probably even proud of yourself. And so that's good. You want God more proud of you? You want people in church more proud of you? Then share your faith more and more and more. Number eight, obedience. God's told us to do this. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. And so it really comes down to just obedience or disobedience. The obedient Christian will share his faith. The obedient Christian will reach people for Christ. The obedient Christian will do what they're told to do. It really it doesn't matter if you want to or not. Obedience is not a matter of feeling. It's simply a matter of obedience. Number nine, faith. By the way, this, this is my favorite. I, I, the, the motivation that I believe God will use my life. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. In, math, in, excuse me, in John chapter 4, Jesus said there is a, there is a white harvest. There is a ripe harvest. And if you and I would truly believe that there are people who want to be saved and who are willing to be saved and ready to be saved, that people, everybody in the world is not saying, I hate God, I don't want anything to do with God, stay away from me, Christian. That the truth is there's a plentiful harvest and there's a ripe harvest that awaits those who will go into the harvest field. Listen, I want to tell you, when nothing else, all these other things didn't work for me, this did. This is the one that got my attention. When I really started to believe, no matter how people acted, no matter if they had a beer can in their hand or not, no matter what language was coming out of their mouth, there were people who wanted to be saved. There were people who were desiring to have a relationship with God. And then number 10, duty. It's the job of every Christian. It's, it's your assignment from God. 
It's your calling from God. It's, 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 it's your responsibility. And you see, some of us are just responsible people. You know, we just, that we just are. Somebody gives us something to do, we're going to do it because we're responsible. And so, what I'm trying to get at is there are all kinds of motivations that people use uh, to, to try to get us to do what we say we want to do and are, are, are created to do. And it's still, you know, something is still lacking. The problem is these, these ten motivators just don't seem to be working. I want to give you a test this morning, okay? Next slide, please. What percentage of Christians are actively sharing their faith with non-believers? What do you what do you think? 1%, 10%, 25, 50 or over 50? What percent? Correct. Statistically, they say 1% of all believers, Christians are active in sharing their faith. Paul tells Philemon, he said, be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing you have in God. A lot of say, well, that's okay. <laughs> I understand enough about the other things. I don't think I really need full understanding. So I want this morning, I want us to maybe just look at this from a little different angle. If, if these other motivations have not really worked for you and don't really seem to be the one that really drives you out into those places where lost people live and are, then I want to share a little different one with you this morning, okay? Out of, out of uh, Matthew 4.19. King James Version, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. You see, my prayer and my belief is that the word of God is so powerful that one verse can change a person's life that you can walk in here one way hear one verse of scripture and walk out of here a completely different person that's the that's the faith I have in the word of God that's the faith I have in the spirit of God that God is able to do that. And so we don't need to go through the whole New Testament. We don't need to go through the whole book of Matthew. We don't need to go through the four gospel accounts. One verse of scripture imprinted on our heart and life will change us forever. This is the discipline of sharing our faith. And there are three truths. Truth number one, the master, the one I chose to follow. And he saith unto them, follow me. This, this is a very special and important concept in my life because I grew up going to church. I went to church. My family, were, we were all, almost always there on Sunday morning and many times there Sunday morning, Sunday night. And so I grew up going to church and yet I learned almost nothing. I was not connected. I was not engaged. I thought, you know, this really doesn't apply to me. I don't really care about this. It doesn't have anything to do with sports. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I just really not, didn't seem to care that much. And so at the age of 22, when I come to Christ, I'm, I don't know really anything. And I, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And honestly, I could, only, I could only think of three things the Lord might want me to do. One was get in a boat and go to Africa and be a missionary. I thought, you know, that's... The, the other was, was stand out on the corner with a bullhorn and, and a Bible and preach at people. And the third thing was to wear a sandwich sign. Because I'd seen that, you know, people on the street, walking up and down the street. And so I thought, is this what I'm supposed to do? And so I said, Lord, what do you want me to do, A, B, or C? And here's what I heard God speak to me. The very first time I heard the inner voice of God, he said, follow me. And I remember going, I think I can do that. Lord, if you'll show me how, I'll follow you. And I've thought back over the last 44 years, and I've thought, I had no idea what, what that meant. I remember sitting on a stage like this, and a thousand ex-Soviet soldiers were sitting out in a, in a hall, and I was getting ready to get up and preach the gospel to them. 
And I thought, who in the world would have ever thought that? I thought of being in the Ukraine and sitting down at a table with all the doctors and nurses in a, in a hospital staff. And they were all saying, we're atheists. We've been told for 70 years, there is no God. Tell us different. And I thought, who would ever have thought that? And to be in a locker room with, with football players and sharing about my faith in Christ. I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, who would have all these different places and, and, and things, God, places I've been and things you've let me do. It all came from hearing the word, follow me. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Let me, let me share a couple things along that line. Jesus said to men, follow me. Jesus leads us to lost people. It's amazing to me how many ways people get led. They get led to start a television ministry. They, they get led, led to be, get involved heavily in politics. They get led to the women's Bible study or the men's Bible study or all these other things that are going on in church. And yet how many people are saying, I'm being led to the lost? I'm being led to the harvest fields. I'm being led to the places where people need to hear the gospel. Luke 19.10, Jesus says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Why is God leading us to do all these other things and not leading us to do what Jesus came to do? Seek and to save the lost. I received a letter this week from a young lady who's incarcerated. And she's made her mistakes, just like you and I have made our mistakes. Most of us didn't get caught making ours. But she said, "Please, could you please help? We need someone to come here and share the gospel. I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to tell what I know. But if somebody could just come in and preach, someone could just come in and share Someone could just come in and, and show the way to Christ. I know there are ladies here who would come to Christ. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that's not happening right now. and We understand many of them. But I'm just saying, there are people and there are places where people are lost and we need to go. The plea of Jesus was... Look at the masses, look at the broken, look at the hurting, look at the scattered. And pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers into the harvest field. Pray that there'll be somebody who'd be willing to go. Jesus leads us to not only lost people, but lonely people. You see, our hearts were, were made by God for connection. That's one thing you can look at every person and you can know. Their heart was made for connection. Their heart was made for connection to God and connection to others. That's the, that's the yearning of people's hearts. That's the desire of people's hearts. A flat screen, an iPhone, a laptop will not meet that need. Only God and people are able to make that connection with our hearts. Listen, if you don't know lost and lonely people, this is about as harsh as I'll ever get, okay? It's because you don't want to. If you don't know lost people and you don't know lonely people, it's because you've chosen not to. Because I'm telling you, they're everywhere. Lost people are everywhere. Lonely people are everywhere. And just this past week, I was, man, if I ever thought, God, I am in a divine place for a divine appointment. I mean, I just had one of those things. I don't think a blind person could have missed this one. It was so obvious to me that I was in a place for divine appointment and divine connection with someone. And I remember how it started off. It started off weeks ago by somebody being so critical of this person, so judgmental of this person. And that's the way we are when we don't care to know people and understand them and listen to their life story and engage with people. It's so easy to cut them off and shut them off and shut them out. And that's where this started. But I had this divine appointment 
sitting down with this person, and they poured their heart out to me. And after they did, I mean, this was about a five minute of sharing their heart. And I said, what you've just told me breaks my heart. And it breaks the heart of God. And all I can tell you is God will mend your heart. God will help you if you let him. And I want you to know I'm, I'm in this with you. I can't make your choices. I can't make your decisions. But I can walk alongside of you. And I'm willing to do that. Jesus said, follow me. The second truth is what I call the molding. The one who shapes my life. And I will make you to become. Now, I'm, a, I'm an NIV guy for a lot of reasons. But let me just tell you this. They missed it on this one. In the NIV, it says, I will send you out. That's not, that's not a good translation of this. The Greek word poieo means to cause you to become something. It's the word picture of a potter molding and shaping a vessel. As he pleases and as he determines. And here's what Jesus says. If, and that's a big if. If you follow me, I will make you to become. I will shape you. I will fashion you. I will form your life. If you follow me. Now that begs the question. If you don't follow him, I don't think that's going to happen. If we go our own ways, it won't, it won't happen. But as and if we follow Jesus, he will shape our life into something special. You ever felt led to do something, but it, it was very uncomfortable? It, I mean, it was one of those you just didn't want to do it. It made you so uncomfortable. God was, you felt like God was leading you to do something, but, but you just didn't want to because of pride or fear or discomfort or whatever. This past week, I had a, a friend of mine call me, and he knew a funeral was coming up. And he said, I'll, I'll do anything I can to help. I said, well, the family would like you to sing a special. He said, uh, okay. <laughs> By the way, I didn't quite get him there. So I said, I got, so in my mind, I go, oh, well, no, I was just kidding about that. They want you to do an interpretive dance of the person's life. <laughs> and the person says, uh, okay. <laughs> you, you get my drift? <laughs> Most of us, God says, you know, I want you to do this. I'm leading you to do this. God, that's, that's uncomfortable. No, thank you. No, I don't want to go there. No, I don't want to talk to that person. No, I don't want to be put in that situation. And so we, we back off. And we don't follow. Listen, salvation is not getting saved and going to heaven. Salvation is getting saved and then letting God mold and shape and prepare your life for heaven. And that only comes as we follow him. Jesus said, follow me. Go where I go. Watch me, listen to me, learn from me. Have the courage, have the faith to follow me, and I will make you to become. We are a work in process. You see, God has broken life down into manageable sections. Days. And he's broken those days down into manageable sections. Hours. And he's broken those hours down into even more manageable sections time and that's that's minutes but as you and I walk with Christ in the minutes and the hours and the days the process continues the wheel the potter's wheel just keeps turning and turning and God does as he chooses and pleases with our life remember remember that old movie karate kid Wax on, wax off. And the kid couldn't understand why Sensei was having him wax a car instead of practice karate moves. And so it goes with your life and my life. The master may have you doing things that are a little bit different 
or don't seem, you know, like, like it's where you want to go and what you want to do. But your life and my life is in process as we follow him. And then we are in progress. Life is not about going around the same mountain 75 times. I know a denomination that's working with an issue, and every year they do the same thing. Let's study it some more. Let's get another study group. Let's get another, let's get another uh, look at this. And so many of us, we've been a Christian one year 30 times. And God's wanting us to grow. God's wanting us to be more and do more. And we could sit here the rest of our lives and say, you know, I'm just not a very good witness. I really don't know how to witness. Well, I'm, hey, it's time to grow up. It's time for us to grow in our faith and become more than we are. What is the new thing? Jesus said, follow me and I will make you to, bec to become what? Point three, the mission, fishers of men. Jesus said, I will make you to become fishers of men. You know, our uh, football team, I really believe, is really starting to gel. There's just some really good things I'm seeing. And I'm not even talking about plays, passes, and runs, and kickoffs, and that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about things I see in these young men's lives. I really feel like they're starting to become a family. And I said, I just, I told them, I said, I just want you to know one thing about me. Here's what I want you to know about me. The desire of my life is to influence you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Every conversation, every situation, every action, every behavior, everything I do. It's to influence you. I can't make anybody do anything. But I can influence, and my, I want my influence on your life to be where you say, I want to become and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I think that's because I saw how much Jesus changed my life. You see, people were always giving me the, the uh, there was a moniker on my life. It was wasted potential. That was their nice way of saying, you're a jerk. <laughs> that was a nice way of saying, well, you're, you're a loser. You're, you're pitiful. You're pathetic. You've got all this potential, and you're not using any of it. And I knew that to be true. I was a failure. I was a miserable failure in life. And everything I did, it seemed like it made it worse. And my sister, who was a fisher of men, came after me. And she threw the net of love over me, and she drew me to Christ. And he changed my life. Wonderfully and powerfully and personally. And I just have that belief that he'll do that for other people. That that's what he wants to do. And so I'm motivated that way. Here's the way I think it works. We catch, God cleans. And I got that off a Christian t-shirt, okay? I'm not that clever. It's not our job to fix people. It's not our job to change people. It's not our job to make people quit doing bad things and start doing good things. It is our job to share the gospel with them. It is our job to share with them how they can know Christ to be a fisher of men, to go out there and try to catch as many as we can to bring them into the kingdom. And secondly, we share God saves. Salvation is of the Lord. It's all Him. It's not about being a slick salesman. It's not presenting some easy, greasy gospel that kind of, you know, blindsides them and they don't know what they're doing. It's about being open and honest and transparent and loving and caring and sharing our faith with others. It may be a word of truth. It may be a gospel tract. It may be a, a word of testimony. But it's us sharing, God saving. So to wrap this up, are you ready to charge hell with a water pistol?
Are you? Have I motivated you? Man, you ready to go out there? See them all saved? That's good. But it's not enough. You see, by the time you get to your car, you'll be thinking about that triple cheeseburger basket. That chicken fried steak with gravy all over it. But I hope, here's my prayer, that when that 30-something waitress with three kids waits on your table, that you will look at her with the eyes of Christ. That you will care about her. That she's not your paid slave to bring your food to your table. That she is a person that Jesus died on the cross for. And he loves her with all of his heart. And there is no mountain he won't climb. There's no place he won't go to reach her. But guess what? It's through us. I had a young lady come and see me this week. An issue going on in her life. And we talked about it. And as we kind of concluded the conversation, she talked about a couple friends that shared verses on social media and, you know, posted things about the Lord and things like this. And she goes, you know, I just, I just don't do that. And I said, that's too bad. Because you have a very beautiful heart. And God could speak so beautifully through you if you just let him. Listen, folks, you have a beautiful, redeemed heart, and God wants to speak his message through you in the oil patch, in the locker room, on the job site. God has this beautiful, redemptive message, and he wants it to flow through each of us to reach, to win. To bring people to faith in Christ. And Stephen set me up really good. And I, I appreciate it. In the uh, the worship bulletin. Which of course I can't find right now. Here it is. Man we made this so simple. <laughs> so big and simple. Just a response card. I'd like to be part of an evangelism training class. I told the football team this past week. About moments when our life is forever changed. We don't expect them. We're not, we don't wake up in the morning going, hey, I'll bet today's the day. We're just going through life. And something happens that just, you, we're just never the same. We just never can go back to who we were from that moment. And I remember being out with John Randalls. He was doing a revival for us in our little church. And John looked at me and he said, you're the most effective personal evangelist I've ever met. Are you kidding me? Me? That's what you think about me? Okay, John. I'll accept that. And I'll seek to be a good personal evangelist. I'm not an evangelist, a mass evangelist, anything, but I can talk with people. I love people. I can talk with them one on one. And I believe I can help you. And so if you want to fill out that response card and put it in the offering plate, and you, you really would like some help, some encouragement, some motivation, some training in sharing your faith, then, then that's my offer to you. I'll do the best I can to teach you how to share your faith with others. I'm not a pro. I'm not an expert. But I, I can help, I believe. Let's pray. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and again we're not this is not a motivational sales talk and rah 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 and go get them team this is one verse of God's holy word to you and Jesus said to them follow me and I will make you to become Fishers of men. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ, never given your life to Christ, with everything in me, I, I plead, I implore, I beg, 
Come to Christ. Give your life to Christ. It's the best decision you will ever make. It's the best decision I ever made. Quit hanging on. Quit holding on to that old life. There is a new life. There is a great, abundant, powerful, wonderful life that God has for you. You have to let go of the old life. You have to say goodbye to the old ways and come to Christ. Here this morning, as a believer in Christ Jesus, and He has spoken to your heart, follow me. Follow me. Our altar's open and you're welcome to come. Father, I thank you for your word. God is so powerful. One, one, not even a sentence, not even a verse, one word can change our lives. But Father, I pray in this invitation time that your will be done. That, Father, there would be many, many, many who say, I will follow Jesus. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I pray, Father, for you to have your way in this invitation time. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. The altar's open. Oh